What's a copy editor? Copy editor is the guardian of his newspaper's character and reputation. The badness of bad writing is never visible to the bad writer. A facility, what an ugly word. A facility is an outhouse. If the Pope did say shit, you are gonna quote him? You better, I'd fire you. If your mother tells you she loves you, check it out. <laughs>
a deer, a female deer, Ray, a drop of golden sun, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Where do we get that, by the way? You've been singing that since you learned it at your mother's knees. Well, some other joint, I don't know, but you learned it. Why do we sing do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do? All music, ultimately, or, or Western music anyway, all Western music comes from uh, the scale, the musical scale, the tonic sulfa. And all language, all English language, comes from the seven parts of speech. And one of the tricks in learning the language to become a master of the language is how to put these things together. That's what's called syntax. You get into logic then, how to put them together logically. And then you get into rhetoric, not the, not the, uh, the debasement of the word rhetoric as we have it today. That's a bunch of rhetoric or campaign rhetoric. Rhetoric is the science or the art of persuasion, of inducing beauty and persuasion into something to, uh, to uh, persuade people to appreciate what you have written. Noun, verb, pronoun, adjective, adverb, preposition, and conjunction. And there you have it. And that's what it's all about. So you can't teach this unless you know it. And one way of finding out how much you know about it is to give you a test. John Bremner had a little test he used in his copy editing classes as a means of finding out what his students did and did not know. I'll give you a few sample sentences from this quiz, see whether you can correctly edit them without rephrasing or rewriting. Don't be too mortified if you're surprised at some of John's answers. This test has been known to embarrass some of the most experienced journalists among us. Volkswagen, uh, I looked around, quite a few of you can't spell it, it's W-A-G-E-N, and uh, a job once in Oklahoma City, and this guy, well, he said, what's the importance of it? So what do you do if there's, a, if there's an accident story involving a Volkswagen? He said, we spell it the way the cops spell it. Now, that's no way, it's, <laughs> that's no way to go through life, you know that. Spell it the way the cops spell it. I said, what you do here? He said, I crossed it out, put Ford. Well, <laughs> If you don't have a dictionary, when in doubt, just put forward in there. Forward. Put your modifier as po close as possible to the word it modifies. Volkswagen is having trouble with only one of their T-H-E-I-R, not, not T-H-E-R-E, for heaven's sake, that's elementary. New models. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that somebody was still awake out there. Just checking on you, that's it, come in. Come in, sucker, that's it, now, stay awake. Of, co of course, it's, it's a collective noun in the United States of America is usually considered to be a singular. The team is, uh, Congress is, the school is, whatever. In Britain, it's treated usually as a plural. And don't knock it, it's their language. We got it from them. They will say Parliament are in session. The government are doing something or other. The team are having their worst season ever. It takes a while to get used to. I'm not saying that you should treat collectives as plurals, but don't say it's wrong. And the fact I treat collectives most of the time as plurals. What are you going to do? Most American newspapers will say, the couple was married yesterday. Great. God bless them. The couple was married yesterday. Then if you're going to be consistent, and then it went to Florida on its honeymoon. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, 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 yes. But then it had an argument. <laughs> and it decided to have a divorce, and it went its separate ways. And, uh, <laughs> the Grand Marshal gave his counsel, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, of course. Now, this is a democracy. We vote on everything. Uh, is it whoever or whomever? Whomever. 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 How many want whomever? Well, that's great. You're wrong. Pronouns agree with their antecedent in person, number, and gender, but they take the case from the clause in which they stand? What? But you have to define seven or eight terms there. I'll give you a gimmick in a minute, but if you're going to go, go through it grammatically, here's the way to do it. Pronouns agree with their antecedent in person. Hey, I said, how many persons in the English language? As many as you like, you know, infinity. Oh, how many numbers in the English language? Many as you like. I don't know. How many cases? Don't ask him what a case is or how many cases there are in the language. Let's try gender. How many genders in the English language? Let's try it on you. Teach, professors, 
How many genders are there in the English language? Two. Two, the man says, three over here, any advance on three? Or decline there from? Anyone want four? Four is correct. Okay. Don't say hell no. Four genders in the English language. Masculine, feminine, neuter, this typewriter, neuter. What gender is the word uh, teacher, professor, student, pupil, parent, child, pilot? Is it masculine? Is it feminine? Is it neuter? Neither? No. It's common. Common gender. Go look it up. I didn't invent it. Whomever and whomever. We've got the four genders. Okay. What's the subject of the verb? What is it? Sought, is it? Who? You wouldn't say him sought it? See it? What's the object of the preposition to? The whole clause. The whole clause. Not whomever. The whole clause. Give it to Charlie. Give it to whoever wants it. It's the subject of the verb. Only one of the people, AP now says we use people for anything, two, three, four, whatever. We don't say two persons, three persons. Only one of the people. Now, is it work or works? Works. Works. How many say work? Three of you right. Ah, oh, what a group. Work is correct. All right, now steady now. Back up. What's the subject of the verb work? Who? Good. What does who refer to? People. people. What number is people? More than one. Plural. People is plural, therefore who is plural, therefore the verb is plural. You say, oh, this is simple stuff. Why is it only three of you got it? I'm not knocking you. You're brilliant. Every one of you wouldn't be here unless you're brilliant. But you see, there are certain fundamental things that we have to either learn or relearn. Work is correct. It's veterinarian. I just put it in there because you so often hear veterinary, 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 and you see it misspelled. Veterinarian comes from a Latin word vetus veterist, meaning old. And veterinarians originally were the were the people who took care of uh, of sick farm animals, old animals usually, and that's how they got to be called veterinarians. I don't use claimed as a verb unless I'm using it in the context of an assertion of a legal right or title. I would say said in this context. He's not claiming a right or title. He said he knew sequence of tenses. Now, a lot of people preach about sequence of tenses but don't follow the sequence of tenses. I don't know. I still teach it. To me, it makes sense. I don't feel well. What did he say? He said he didn't feel well. I'm speaking. I don't feel well. What did he say? He said he didn't feel well. You automatically change present to past when the controlling verb is said, when the controlling verb is a verb in the past tense, not present tense. He says he doesn't feel well. He said he didn't feel well. Now, I will go to Florida, please God, in a couple of weeks. What did he say? He said he would go to Florida. Change future to conditional. I've been here only 24 hours. What did he say? He said he had been here. Change perfect to past perfect. We've just edited four sentences. There were 14 more on that demonic test. How'd you do? Perfectly, I hope. But perfection is not as important as the recognition that these are the kinds of problems confronted daily in copy editing. Let's listen to John Bremner defining the duties of that job. A copy editor is the guardian of his newspaper's character and reputation. And you can add a sentence to him and say, he's also a univac. <laughs> and you can explain what a univac is, put a period there and say, he knows something about everything. And uh, everything about something. And where to go to find out what he doesn't know. What are the duties of a copy editor? Well, you know them. You'll find them listed in any text, although I don't use a text, but you can get them from a text. He corrects errors of fact. Excuse me. She corrects errors of fact. <laughs> and um, she corrects grammar, spelling, punctuation, usage. She makes the story a proper literary effort, in short. 
She makes the uh, story conform to the style book, be it the AP style book or a style book for a particular paper, and uh, any supplementary style book that you may have. And I'll give you a copy of that shortly. Uh, checks for libel. Uh, checks for unanswered questions. Uh, exercises news judgment, meaning does the lead summarize the story? Is the lead substantiated in the story? And uh, are both sides of a story uh, represented or several sides of a story represented in a controversial story? What else does she do? She uh, cuts the story for space, according to the directions received from the desk. And uh, have I forgotten anything except the two biggies at the end? She writes headlines which to me is the most exciting part of being a copy editor. And uh, in most cases, especially on smaller papers, she's responsible for a lot of makeup. That's a clear list of responsibilities, but what enables someone to carry them out? John Bremner defined not only the role, he also defined the virtues that were required to fulfill it. And through anecdote and practical example, he taught students how to apply these virtues. What are these virtues? Accuracy. That sounds basic, but Bremner had collected numerous news clippings in which accuracy was hilariously absent, and he used them to prod his students into vigilance. Consistency. That's more subtle and more difficult to teach. Let's see how Bremner tackled that. The toughest thing to teach, you will find, if you get right into it, is consistency. You have to have learned what I call the thrill of monotony. <laughs> Any fool can live on the thrill of novelty, but to get up and go to work and do the same thing over and over again, day, month, year after year after year, takes a special talent, takes a lot of patience, perseverance, but a love of consistency. And I'm not holding up the AP style book as the model. As somebody remarked earlier, the AP very often doesn't follow its own. AP doesn't edit nearly so much as it used to, nearly so much as it should, or the UPI for that matter. Uh, but it's your responsibility to see that, uh, that, that uh, there is consistency. Suspicion, another virtue. Take nothing for granted in a newsroom. Outside the newsroom, trust everybody. Outside the newsroom, if I had to put an epitaph on a grave, I would say it's better to be fooled occasionally than to be suspicious constantly. I don't know any other way of going through life. It's better to be fooled, because you're going to be fooled anyway, no matter how smart you think you are. Better to be fooled occasionally than to be suspicious, paranoid, constantly. Except, ladies and gentlemen, in the newsroom. And you have to teach those young men and women in your hands to be healthfully suspicious. You need also a great sense of fairness whenever there's a story involving more than one point of view to make sure that all points of view get a chance to say something. And don't lie. And don't say it couldn't be reached. Above all, don't say it couldn't be contacted. What a lousy verb. Uh, your students have to be saturated with the news. The next thing I emphasize for you is that you have to be thick-skinned because it is your responsibility to correct. And I don't just mean the writing, I mean the speech. It's your responsibility to correct their language, and they have to develop thick skins and take that criticism. They can't take criticism as students, they'll never take it as adults. And those of you who've worked in newsrooms, especially in decent-sized papers, you know that you have to take criticism or you get the hell out. Isn't that right, Mr. Thien? The question then arises, do we ever change a quote? Well, let me give you my principle. I would never make an ordinary citizen look bad. I'd never make it appear that I were being condescending, or rather that I was uh, uh, showing this guy up if he goofed in speech. What do you do, however, if you get a, if you get a, a public figure who goofs in a quote? You're going to correct it? Suppose you have to use it. You can't paraphrase it. No answers. Quote of the way he said it. I'm not talking about obscenity here. I'm just talking about usage, grammar. Anyone disagree? 
depends on how informal the interview was. It depends on the circumstances. If there's a television camera going, I would do entirely differently. Very important, the television bit. Which you will accept, I know, Don, because if they read it in the paper one way in the afternoon and then see it on television at night or the next morning or whatever. Uh, a great example of that was, uh, you remember when Alexander Haig was president of the United States? You remember that? That day? Okay. Uh, what the hell happened? Ronnie was sick, wasn't it? Wasn't that it? Shot. 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 That's right. I was sick. <laughs> I've forgotten the circumstance. And they couldn't find George anywhere. He was flying around Texas, as I recall. And Haig stepped in and took over. He had, he had no way. He was, constitutionally, he had no rights. But uh, anyway, they finally got George back to Washington and propped him up in front of all the camera, the microphones. And, uh, and George said, uh, I quote exactly. I want to reinsure the American people, etc. I was on the road the next day and able to see different papers. The AP story said, I want to reassure, which is probably what he intended to say, American people. The LA Times Washington Post story said, I want to assure the American people. And one paper, in fact, was Indiana, a small paper up here edited it and said, now you may disagree with this, you may say it's editorializing, I liked it, said, as a sign of his nervousness, comma, Vice President Bush began his remarks with, I want to reinsure. I thought that was a great way to handle it. It got the thing across and explained it. And I don't think it's editorializing. It was obvious if you were watching that Bush was nervous. Read the whole story before you write the headline. Main sin Don, that I found going around the country in editing copy was that either so many of the copy editors were ignorant or they were harried and didn't have enough time. That the copy readers are just looking at the first couple of graphs, particularly of a wire story, enough to get a grasp of the story, slap the head on, and get the next one and get the damn paper out. Okay? Just read two or three graphs enough to grasp the guts of the story so they can write a dull headline and get going. One of John Bremner's favorite teaching tools, and possibly his most entertaining one, was his cherished collection of headlines. Some of these were brilliantly conceived examples of journalistic wit. More of them were examples of journalistic dimness, and a few were just plain mystifying. Bremner hoped that the good ones would be inspiring, and the bad ones would counter future editorial temptations to slap on a hasty headline or two before heading out to lunch. My favorite non-headline on a non-story. <laughs> That's true, sure. Most of these heads are from around the area of the newspapers I read. No verb, no subject, no nothing. What is that? What's that mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's a classic headline. You'll find that in a lot of collections. Willamette Chronicle. Are you going to manufacture screws? You start a company, you call it a screw company. <laughs> <laughs> Herb Kane of the San Francisco Chronicle gave that the headline award of the year in, 18, in 1972. <laughs> 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 you can save that for a story. It must be some Canadian club in some league that finishes fifth. <laughs> <laughs> That's a minor miracle. <laughs> Oh, great. That's an announcement of doom. <laughs> Don't use a present tense verb with a time element in a headline. It makes a future. Now, read your headlines aloud, students. In the hills of Kentucky, a farmer was sitting in his outhouse one morning, and uh, it all of a sudden exploded. <coughs> the poor guy was buried underneath all that uh, rubble. And uh, the word was that he was dead, and the stringer got the story in. But the neighbors, as will happen in the hills, dug and dug and dug, got the guy out and were able to resuscitate him, and he was not dead. Read your heads aloud. Act or accidentally shot in the butt. 4-H go wins contest as best whore in county. Good advice. <laughs> Pop.
impossible, too. Uh, <laughs> this is not easy to do. You look at this. <laughs> what? Yes. <laughs> I'd like one of those. Uh, <laughs> you'd like to give me a present? That would be a nice present at my age. A little sexual battery. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a good contest? Write the second line for that headline. <laughs> That's the origin of man. A little thing with a tail, a little duck with a tail. <laughs> Happiest horse in the world. <laughs> That's the filthiest head I've ever seen. Uh, I never could understand that headline. My, my Methodist friends won't tell me. Did, was she so grateful that she became a Methodist after the operation? I like that. That's an honest headline. We should have it a little more frequently on a dull day. We come out and say, not much is happening. On that rare day when not much was happening in John Bremner's life, he would always have been able to find some excitement by riffling through a dictionary. He could satisfy his lifelong passion for language by discovering some fascinating new word, some unsuspected meaning, some revealing derivation. He tried to inspire the same appreciation in his students. In an anecdote about the poet John Charty, also a dictionary enthusiast, John Bremner shows his own delight in words. Charlie was lecturing on browsing. What he does, in fact, he's published two books on browsing. What he does when he's dry, his poetic soul is dry, and he doesn't know what to write a poem about. He says he browses. He browses through a dictionary, which is what I do. He browses through the catchwords, the words in boldface at the top of every column, telling you the first entry and usually the last entry. And he was telling this huge audience that one day he was dry and he was browsing through the W's. And he ran into words that he had uh, uh, never heard, uh, come into contact with before. Widgeon, W-I-D-G-E-O-N, a shorebird. A wikipee, a tree, a species of tree, W-I-C-O-P-Y. Wikiup, W-I-C-K-I-U-P, a species of uh, Indian dwelling. He says, any, any poet, by virtue of his being a poet who runs into Widgeon and Wikipedia and Wikiup, has to write a poem. So he recited the poem. And it went like this. In fact, it still goes like this. He calls it a Widgeon and a Wikipedia. You have to just listen for the W's. And I'm giving you this just as a sample of uh, sonic associations with words. A Widgeon in a Wikipedia. Isn't this fun? Copy editing. We're talking about widgeons and wikipedias. A widgeon in a wikipedia in which no widgeon ought to be, a widowed, there's the key word, a widowed widgeon was. While in a willow wiki up, a Wichita, Indian, sat down to sup with other Wichita. And what they whittled as they ate was what had been of late a widgeon's wing. was thus a widgeon in a wikipedia in which no widgeon ought to be a widowed widgeon was that's all and if you don't like that get out of this business <laughs> after more than a third of a century spent nurturing the english language john bremner retired in 1986 with his wife mary his motivation and inspiration he moved to an apartment in florida overlooking the ocean he died there of cancer the following year. Like John Bremner, I've long been worried about the fate of this language of ours. Like him, I've waged war against bureaucratic gobbledygook, against the unnecessary, if you'll pardon the expression, verbing of nouns, and the plague of misused hopefullies. Sometimes I am almost convinced that America will be the death of English. But as long as the spirit of John Bremner is abroad among us, English may yet live to be loved by future generations.